What a race weekend. Like so many others, and yet like no other. The familiar crowds, everyone seeking an autograph, an endless chain of ceremonies, and the occasional special dedication. And finally, the big race itself, starring the king, Richard Petty. November 15, 1992, Richard saddled up old number 43 for the 1185th time. But this time, it's different. The career that spanned generations ends here. Imagine the memories this last time in the cockpit that was his sanctuary from the crowd and the cameras. And now memories are all that remain. Spectacular to the end, Richard's exit scene was a fireworks display. But they fixed his car after this big crash, and he took that final checker. The thud in mid-race and the fire that followed were not enough to keep the king from ending his day in style. If indeed life is a canvas we fill with our own brush, then Richard Petty is a Rembrandt among racers. His life story, an intricate and colorful masterpiece. Its title, very simple. Portrait of a King is presented by the First Brands Corporation. An impressive array of Sam Bass images of Richard Petty provide the backdrop for our Portrait of a King. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Despain. We welcome you. It is now official. Richard Petty's career as a driver is over. He is the only man in sport whose retirement could have created all the fuss that we've seen here today and indeed all season long. The phenomenon begs for comparison. I'm reminded of Jabbar's last campaign, all those emotional tributes in arenas that he played for the final time. But there's a big difference. Basketball was there before Kareem hit the boards. Stock car racing is entirely a product of Richard Petty's lifetime. From the motorized backwoods brawls that lured his daddy to the current love affair with the Fortune 500, Richard has lived and breathed the creation of the sport. He is its biggest star, indeed its embodiment. And having given us so much, now he's given us the Fan Appreciation Tour. the end of Richard Petty's driving career. Our racing masterpiece we'll admire in detail when we come back. Portrait of a King is presented by the First Brands Corporation, the makers of STP gas treatment. Thank you the best way we can as we dedicate this portion of US 220 to you and publicly mark your achievements. I never started out to set records, never thought about setting records. Uh, I just went out and did what I wanted to do and was real fortunate to be able to do what I did. And in the meantime, the records came along. All right, Richard, I'll buy that. You didn't set out to rewrite the stock car record book. It just happened that way. But those records are important here because they are the milestones. 
and one by one they marked the path that Richard traveled from gangly North Carolina kid to the king of stock car racing to something more than that. Let's go to John Kernan in our nation's capital. Here in Washington, D.C., where this museum, the Smithsonian, houses some of our country's greatest milestones, Richard is also included, along with pieces of Americana that have helped shape our nation's history. As the car that accomplished win number 200 back in 1984 sits quietly in this hall, its presence here truly puts into perspective the enormity of Richard's achievements. Richard recorded his first historic achievement back in May 1967 as he notched career win number 55, bypassing his father's record of 54. Not even a famed Darlington stripe could stop Richard from cashing in the money that day. Although his father, Lee, was there in victory lane to help him pick up the check. But the victory celebration was far from over that season. Teaming with brother Maurice, the Petty Boys ran off with an unbelievable 27 wins that year, including 10 in a row. Records that still stand today and likely will never be challenged. That particular record of, uh, of 27 wins in what, 47 races or 46 races, whatever we run, uh, they don't run that many races now. You know, some of the records and stuff that are, might be completely out of the realm of possibility because the circumstances now and the system is so much different than what it was when I came through. As the 60s came to a close, America focused on the unknowns of space exploration as man walked on the moon. Meanwhile, in North Carolina, Richard Petty was exploring his own uncharted territory, picking up career win number 100. In Bowman Gray Stadium in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, 1969, a uh, quarter mile flat asphalt track around the football field. As the years passed, Petty continued his exploration of the unknown, logging his 100,000th mile in 1972 at Ontario. And some 11 years later, a young cable network got a thrill of its own, covering a little bit of history. Bob Jenkins makes the call. Bill Elliott from Dawsonville, Georgia, looking for his first win onto the trioval. Still, Richard Petty leads the way as we have two laps to go. This is the final lap at Rockingham, less than a mile to go. Here they come for the fourth turn and the start finish line coming up. Bill Elliott will make one desperate attempt as he goes to the inside. Richard Petty holds him off and Richard Petty picks up a victory at Rockingham North Carolina Motor Speedway, his first since 1981. And the crowd celebrates with King Richard. It's been a long time since he was in victory lane and ESPN has brought you his victory live this afternoon. It was emotional for me. I thought I was glad I had my sunglasses on where they couldn't see how emotional I got. But when your daughters do something like that in front of all the people, and it's like I say, it's thousands start. That was a, that was a big, uh, another one of our big days. It's Richard Petty. He wraps up the STP Pontiac Yarborough, hounding him. It's just nose to tail on the back straightaway. Up ahead, five slower cars as they move for turn number three. Yarborough now dives to the inside, tries to get inside the STP Pontiac. He's not there. Now he is up beside Richard Petty as they hit turn three. Yarborough down low. Petty's up the banking yard. Yarborough pulls up in front of him. Petty right up on his bumper, points his nose down inside. They race back to the checkers. A lap car ahead. Petty right down to the apron. They're side by side. Richard drafts down to the bottom of the racetrack. They are door to door in the dog leg. They touch, coming to the trioval down to the line. It is, it's Richard Petty by a foot. Petty wins his 200th career NASCAR victory. The only record I ever really wanted was the 200th one. And that, when I got it, I couldn't, couldn't do no more. But uh, that was the only one that I really, really tried to get. Richard Petty really is one of our country's great pioneers, truly deserving of his place in American history. If I set a goal and uh, got to it, I didn't set it high enough. And uh, then if I set one and never did get it, then I was always going to be disappointed. But I always looked at the uh, situation of saying, you know, let's just do better today than we did yesterday. And uh, I always felt like we'd go forward that way.
little bit of, of uh, blue that was left over from a 55 Dodge, and I had some white left over from a 57 Chevrolet. And, uh, you know, if we mixed it together, it was going to be enough paint to paint the car. So we mixed it together, and we probably had a gallon of paint, a gallon and a half, whatever it took to paint the car. Had enough paint to paint the car. We got through and we said, hey, man, that's pretty. The sunglasses came about, used to, when we used to run a lot of dirt tracks and stuff. I wore those bubble goggles, and they kept getting sweaty and to get dust in behind them and stuff. And, you know, again, my eyes were always sensitive to, to light, so I got to wearing sunglasses. And uh, then I got to wearing them in the race car. And I got this particular kind that was wrapped around that, you know, the wind would go around them, and, and you didn't sweat in them anyway. They'd get dirty, but you wouldn't sweat. And then the, the hat and stuff, I guess it came about probably in the uh, early 70s, somewhere along there. Uh, just got in the habit of, of wearing a cowboy hat. It was one of those deals where if, if I had a STP hat on, I was talking to the Pontiac people, or if I was talking to the Pontiac people, I had a Goodyear hat on, or talking to Goodyear people, I had a Goodies hat on, so, you know, it just kind of messed up stuff. So uh, I just got in the habit of wearing a hat, and uh, kind of worked out good. Uh, works out good if the sun's shining, or works out good if it's raining. We got with STP in uh, 1972, and uh, you know up up until then, uh, I was real fortunate that most of the time we had factory backing, so we sent a car on the Riverside, and myself and uh, Dale Inman and my brother Maurice went by Chicago to see Andy about a sponsorship. Now this is like three days before the race, before the season started. I mean that's that's how business oriented we were. You know everything worked out. An STP paint job, a pair of shades, and a cowboy hat. We could add to that list and find here in Sam Bass's paintings the rag between the teeth, boots in place of fancy driving shoes, and of course that big number 43. Forget the crown and the scepter. The reign of Richard Petty is marked by symbols unique to this particular king. And there's one more stock car icon synonymous with the Petty name. Just as Yankee Stadium became the house that Babe Ruth built, so too did the most famous track in Richard's sport emerge as his personal domain. Let's go there now and hear from Dr. Jerry Punch. In IndyCar racing, it's the Brickyard. In stock car racing, there is no more hallowed ground than Daytona International Speedway. Many drivers will complete their careers without ever once visiting Victory Lane here at the World Center of Racing. One man and one man only has won the Daytona 500 seven times. We're talking about the king, Richard Petty. So who better to name an achievement award for accomplishments here at Daytona than this man? You know, millions of fans have enjoyed his accomplishments week after week. But it takes a fellow competitor to really understand how difficult those achievements actually were. In 1964, I was in my fifth year of stock car racing, and Richard was entering his seventh. And what took me 16 years later to accomplish, Richard Petty did that February. When he won that Daytona 500 in 1964, that's when it, and, and under very adverse conditions, that's when I thought, hey, this guy's got something. And despite having a lot of tire trouble uh, and having to make an extra pit stop, uh, he kept his cool and won the race. In 1966, Richard won his second Daytona 500 in a rain-shortened race. He would go on to win the Daytona 500 six times before I'd end up in victory lane. But one of my best early shots at victory came when I was teammates with Richard in 1971. Richard Petty, random in North Carolina, has won the Daytona 500 for the third time. Richard Petty wins the Daytona 500, the first man to ever win it four times. And the STP cheering section, turn one goes wild. Richard Petty has just won the Daytona 500 for Andy Granatelli. All right, Petty is coming around to take the checkers in the battle for the second place. We'll go all the way around the speedway one more time. Here come those cars fighting for second across the line. There's the checker out, and the STP Dodge of Richard Petty has won the Daytona 500. They're out of turn two. They're down the back stretch. Here goes Kale on the inside. Kale makes the move. He's down very close to the grass. Down he tries to shut him off. Kale's in the grass. Kale loses it. He tries to pull it back. Down he side by side. They make contact. Both head toward the wall. They hit the wall. And turn number three will have a new leader. 
Here they come to the stripe. Richard Petty's STP Oldsmobile. Waltrip dives to the inside. Petty almost put him off in the grass. And Richard Petty will win the Daytona 500. 1980 was finally my year at Daytona. But in 1981, the man who challenged Richard was Bobby Allison. In 1978, I won my first Daytona 500. While in 1980, I finished second to Buddy. So in 1981, I was ready for victory number two in the 500. But Richard was looking for his seventh. And when it was all over, it came down to pit strategy. The team leaders were telling me, you know, we got to run easy, we got to go easy. And I was saying, we need to go ahead and go when we ran out of gas. Richard Petty was sitting there, um, pitted at the proper time, and coasting around that racetrack out of gas is what cost the race. In this Richard Petty's final year of competition, racetracks all across the country have added thousands of these seats. And even that wasn't enough to accommodate the millions of fans who wanted their chance to say farewell to the king. Ironically, many of those fans weren't even born when Richard Petty won his first of seven Winston Cup championships. The year was 1964. Lyndon B. Johnson was president, but a youthful Richard Petty was about to establish himself as the king. Over the next 11 years, the victories mounted and the championships followed. But it was his seventh and final title, one with an incredible comeback over a young Darrell Waltrip that remains his most cherished. That was a, a dramatic situation, coming back from, from not doing good the year before and then coming back all the way that year and then winding up winning the championship. So it was a very gratifying championship. In many sports, stardom is flickering. It goes as quickly as it comes. Arguably, no other sports legend has impacted their sport this century as much as Richard Petty. Throughout his career, which spans some five decades, the legend of the king has been witnessed and enjoyed by generation after generation. And although he may no longer drive, in the hearts of millions of fans, long will live the king. farewell season, Richard Petty's career has been recounted, undoubtedly embellished, and his presence has been endlessly hyped. Richard, for one, and I, for two, will be glad to see the end of the hype. Point is, if we judge this career by what's been said in the last 12 months, there wouldn't be a wart in sight. And in fact, what Richard said a long time ago was, it ain't always pretty. Amid all the highlights, there were also controversial run-ins with other drivers, complaints that the Petties were the privileged haves in a world of have-nots, there was, do I dare say, cheating in the context of the king? Call it creative interpretation of the rules. And worst of all, there were those crashes. Benny Parsons has some thoughts on the bad times. You're right, Dave. Richard Petty has had many bad things happen to him, but a lot of good things as well. Probably none better when they dedicated the statue to the king. But Richard Petty, like most race car drivers, remember the bad things much better than the good. He'll probably never forget Darlington, 1970. <laughs> That was one of the, the worst wrecks I had uh, broke the steer and the car come down to the inside, turned over four or five times, and my arm kept coming out the window, and look, it, it really, really looked bad. When we got to him, the car was upside down, and his arms, you know, he's long and lanky, and his arm was just limp laying in the car, and, and I, you know, the first thing I thought that he was dead, you know, and, and of course, I'm in the car with him, and when I unstrapped the belts, and we're trying to hold him, you know, a big lanky body like that, he hit pretty hard when he did come down. And uh, he groaned, and so I know he was alive. The 1976 Daytona 500, a classic Petty David Pearson battle, results in the ugliest but most memorable finish in history. As they hit the banking, they're three abreast with a lap car. Pearson moves in front of the STP Dodge. Petty comes back to the inside. They almost touch as they move down low in the banking. They're going to be side by side as they exit the bank and head for the finish line. Richard Petty goes back in front. They both spin. They're in the wall. Petty is sliding, slamming in the wall. He's coming down toward the finish line. Will he make it? He's still moving. The car stops 300, 400 feet shy of the finish line. Pearson is still running. 
Here's Petty trying to fire to come across the line. David Pearson moving down through as they come to the stripe. The winner is car number 21. At the time, he didn't know it, but he had me beat. If he hadn't come over and, and you know, and we hit, people want to know if I was mad, and I said, no. I remember exactly what, what I said. I said, no, I'm not mad. But if I hadn't won the race, I believe it would have been, you know. <laughs> After Pearson, Richard's biggest rivalry came with Bobby Allison. There were times when he wanted to run on the same part of the racetrack that I wanted to run on. Exactly. And uh, somehow, I was able to get my car up to good enough speed that I could be there in, on that part of the racetrack that he wanted to be on, where a lot of the other guys couldn't keep up. And, uh, you know, that did put us at each other uh, frequently, you know, almost constantly. One of the enjoyments that I've had along the way is being able to be a pain in the neck to Richard Petty. There were younger challengers, including Darrell Walter, who learned some hard lessons from the King fast. Well, you can see it happening right before you. They're coming to turn three. Two more turns to go. Richard Petty still side by side. Sonny Ellison is still hanging in third. Oh! Petty has got the lead, but there comes Walter down below him as Petty slid up by. Sonny Ellison trying to move past Petty into second place. They're coming to the finish line. It is Darrell Walter winning the Rebel 500. Petty is second. I didn't get the full impact of what Richard Petty meant to this sport or who he was until I actually started to compete in it. When I stepped it up a notch and I got to run in that crowd, uh, I was a little bit eager. That's when I really got to know Richard on a personal basis. And I'm talking like up close and personal, you know? He take that old, he got the longest, get him to show you this finger right here sometime. He can stand four feet away from you and point you, poke you in the chest with this finger and it's crooked. I don't know whatever happened to him. When he comes up to you and he takes that long finger and starts pointing you in the chest, poking you in the chest, and uh, looking at you through those dark glasses, there's some beady little eyes in behind them little dark glasses, I'm here to tell you. I watched him on the truck. You know, I stand in the infield and watch him race, you know, and never thought I'd be racing against him, and then here I am in a race car at Charlotte Motor Speedway, and I'm fighting this big Dodge and running about 29th or 30th, and everything's all lovely in my little world, and about time Richard Petty goes by me at about 100 mile an hour faster than I'm running, scares me to death, and, you know, you realize he, who he is and what he's doing. That was the first race he ever won at Charlotte, too. It was the first race I ever drove there. The Petty name managed to escape most controversy until win number 198 at Charlotte. Bill France runs NASCAR, and he comes in, and he starts talking. He says, okay, so, you know, they, they got you on this tire deal, so we're going to have to work out something here, you know, how uh, penalize you and fine you and all that. I said, okay, so they was working on something. And Dad Gunford didn't call up there and said, hey, guys, your motor's a little bit big here. <laughs> you know, and man, we just both threw up our hands in. I said, oh, me. I said, we're in deep trouble here. It was a tough call to make, but uh, it had to be made. And uh, we did not put the engine, when I say we, NASCAR, did not put the engine in the car, nor the tires on the car. Uh, I really hate it for Richard and Maurice but somebody in the organization had to make the call, and they got called. Perhaps the King's darkest moment came in 1988, when the Hush Daytona crowd thought they may have seen the last of the King. They were replaying it on a closed circuit uh, TV, and I stopped, and all at once, I re it hit me that this was Richard in this car, and it was just flipping and coming apart, and. And even when it stopped in the middle of the track, uh, he took a tremendous impact again. And I thought, my, the first thought in my mind was that uh, they're not being truthful here. You know, I know he must be dead. I walked back to the area where they had brought him in, and there he lay. And he, he smiled, and you, there was not a scratch on his body. Gentlemen, start your engines. Then in 1992, the King's final days at the Speedway almost resulted in a pole position. But one driver had other ideas. And look at the King. He has pulled alongside the pace car, carrying the president, and they're saluting each other. President Bush with the thumbs up to King Richard Petty as he slides back now into his starting position outside the front row alongside Sterling Marlin. If we could have got the pole, uh, I'd really love to see him got it. And, uh, you know, our bunch worked real hard uh, on the speedway stuff, and I knew it was going to be close the first lap he ran, and 
I don't know if I beat him or not. And uh, sure enough, when I come back around, the crowd was booing, so I didn't beat him. They go two by two through the banking in turns three and four. Petty to the inside, Sterling Marlin to the outside. Here they come down off the banking to about to complete lap number one. Who is going to have the lead? They're side by side as they come down. Richard Petty is going to lead it. That's magic, Ned. Yes, sir. That, that was great. This picture is live from Atlanta Motor Speedway. King Richard's ride had a pretty rough day. This his final day as a race car driver. This ESPN special, Portrait of a King, is being brought to you by the First Brands Corporation. Richard Petty grew up in Level Cross, a wide spot on the road to Randleman, North Carolina. His Carolina small-town heritage shaped every facet of his character and shaped them permanently. His friends then are his friends now. You and I may lift him onto a pedestal, seat him on a throne, but the guy is really the king of the common man. From the family race shop, Richard's boyhood environment, here's ESPN stock car analyst Ned Jarrett. This is where it all began, Petty Enterprises. Today, it's a high-tech racing facility. But some 40 years ago, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears were shed between those walls as men worked 24 hours a day to build race cars for Lee Petty. Then sons Maurice and Richard Petty would carry the torch as they tried to follow their dreams in auto racing. It all began on February 28, 1960, when a man named Dick Petty won his first race. When I first started running, uh, a lot of the press did call, call me Dick. Uh, it's just an automatic nickname for Richard. And uh, I don't know, they did that for a little while after I started running, and then I think I won a race or two, and it was Dick Petty won the race. And, and uh, I think Mother found three or four reporters together one day, and uh, she just went up to them and said, if I want him called Dick, I would have named him Dick. His name is Richard, and I want to see his name put down as Richard. So after that, it's always been Richard. With guidance from his dad, Lee, Richard's career began to evolve. Lee took the first Daytona 500 in 1959. Five years later, in 1964, Richard won his first Daytona 500. He also went on to take his first Grand National title that year while following in his father's footsteps and bringing the petty name to a new level in auto racing. As Richard's career evolved, he never lost sight of his roots in Randleman or the people who were always there to support him. A newly dedicated statue watches over the streets of Randleman, North Carolina, as the citizens of that town show their thanks to their favorite son, the former Randleman High athlete who woke up their quiet town. As most people say, Richard has put Randleman on the map. And uh, when you go anywhere, people say, where are you from? We'll say we're from Randleman. That's where a town Richard Petty went to school and, and grew up, you know. So he's really put Randleman on the map. He's the, probably the coolest athlete that it's ever been in, in the history of the world. I mean, he's hadn't changed and he's worked at uh, keeping this level of, of, of knowing, you know, where he came from. Not only has he given a lot of money to things in the area, but he's also had uh, events that caused him to be able to raise money for themselves, too. And I think they all probably realize they owe him a big debt of gratitude. Some things never change in Richard's day, like lunch at Frank and Larry's. He does an order. When he walks in, we just take two hot dogs and a pint of milk to him. That's what he gets every time. He likes everything on I'm glad I've had a chance to be around him, be around him, talk to him. I've, I've enjoyed it. One of the King's best friends, most prized memories, came on the playing fields where they grew up at Randleman High. Richard always knew how to make a sad situation better. I fought this battle with cancer and they amputated my leg. I go on my crutches to this game and, you know, everybody is so pitiful, you know, poor Ronnie and all this stuff and, you know, I couldn't. I couldn't stand that. And anyway, I was sitting up there in the stands, and here comes Richard. Comes up. It's the first time he'd seen me since I got out of the hospital. 
He said, well, Ronnie, he says, uh, cut it off kind of short, didn't he? <laughs> he's done good. He's, he, you can't tell Richard nothing. He's, he's already figured it out, and he knows how to retire. He knows how to raise. He knows how to be a family man. And, uh, you can't tell him nothing. <laughs> I mean, you know, he don't need to be told nothing. I mean, you know, he's, uh, he's Richard. the day he came to the world in the usual way but there were planes to catch and bills to pay he learned to walk while i was away and he was talking for i knew it and as he grew he'd say i'm gonna be like you dad you know i'm gonna be like you this is the house my parents lived in when they were first married i lived there for a little while when they first got married they worked really hard to make things better for them better for us as we grew up but like I've said before, you know, it was a normal childhood. It was just like anybody else's. When, until I was nine or 10 years old, I thought everybody's parents had a race car. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time at racetracks, a lot of time following Richard Petty around the racetrack. But I think the most special time we spent together was around the dinner table. My kitchen has changed quite a lot, but this kitchen holds a lot of good memories for our family. When we first moved into home, we had a small table in the corner, and this was where, at our meals, we shared the events of the day. The children were always telling us about their day at school. Richard was telling us about his day in the shop, and on Mondays, we always shared the events of the, of the day before the previous race. Well, as far as I was concerned, it was normal. Uh, you know. You know, we grew up, our father wasn't there a lot of the time. He was always going to racetracks and, and stuff like that. But, you know, we had a normal childhood. Uh, I've got three sisters, three younger sisters. We all went to school down here in Randleman. Uh, we all did all the things that everybody else did. We would go to the track and we would play around. And we knew Daddy was out there racing, but we really didn't pay attention. You know, at the end of the day, Mom would say, OK, come on, load up, it's time to go. Or, or come on, let's go to Winter Circle. And we would run to the Winter Circle and, you know, we would it was fun, but I don't think it hit us that he had won the race. I mean, I didn't know what that meant. Christmas here is, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. And nobody's as big a kid as Daddy himself. I mean, he, he thinks he's Santa Claus, and it just makes him happy to, to make everybody else happy. I guess as far as childhood, I had the happiest that anybody could ever dream of having. Um, it was just like... Um, Disneyland at our house. I mean, it was just a fun place, a fun time, and always happy, always um, going, always doing, just, you know, I, I just, my whole memory of my childhood is, is just a dream. They see him in a different light. They, they see the, the, a side of Richard Petty that the public doesn't see. Um, and they are very defensive. I mean, they are, if, if they read any bad press, if they hear anything said bad, oh, they want to respond to me like, that is not how our dad is, they say. They just perceive me as, as plain old Richard Petty, plain old daddy, and, uh, and let it go at that. I, I don't think that they see me as special as what the fans see me. Uh, they might see me special, but in a different light. Those of you expecting to see Virginia Slim's tennis, stay tuned. That action from Philadelphia following this ESPN special. You're watching live as the sun sets on the historic day of Richard Petty's last ride. Portrait of a King is presented by First Brands Corporation. You know, every pundit in racing and many more outside the sport have taken the opportunity in the past year to have their say about the King. That's well and good. He deserves the accolades. But the most interesting perception of the King is that of the King himself. Let's begin with the matter of how he got that nickname. I think that came about uh, about 1966 or 67. 
Uh, we'd had a couple of real good years there, and uh, everything was working good. And uh, I think three or four of the regular reporters, maybe more, uh, probably out drinking one night. Anyhow, they got to they got to talking about it. And you know, different people had different nicknames. They nicknamed uh, Pearson and a couple of others. You know, that uh, Fireball had a nickname. You know, there was just just different situations. Uh, gentleman Ned, you know, all this kind of stuff. And uh, so I think they just got to talking about it and they said, you know, we, we got to come up with Rapid Richard or some kind of a name. And uh, so, uh, I don't know, one of them said something about King Richard. And, you know, if my name had been Joe or Bill, it couldn't have been King Bill or King Joe. My name was right to go with King. I don't know if anybody will ever come along with the circumstances as good as what Richard Petty did. Uh, I think that's the key when you really look down to it, really deep down, that, uh, the opportunity, the situation, uh, the personality, uh, circumstances, all was for Richard Petty. It was very progressive what I did, but it was all a natural trait. I never really set out to accomplish anything. Uh, I never set out to accomplish the popularity part, signing autographs, or any of this kind of stuff. I just, I just did it, and uh, as the demand came, I just went along with the demand. I never said, "Time out. Let's just. This is as far as we're going to go." I think I'm very satisfied. I, 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 I don't know that I'd do anything over again, Ned. Uh, I think I come along at the right time, at the right place, under the right circumstances, to be able to live a, a life that I wanted to live. I think one of the key philosophies is, is treat people like you'd like to be treated. Uh, I try to do that with the fans, I try to do that with the sponsors, I try to do that with the press. I look at other people the way I want them to look at me and, and vice versa. So uh, I won't have a different uh, philosophy now in racing and my philosophy is, is win races as a car owner. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have a pretty good driving career and have a good, a good record in that. And what I want to do is close the book on, on Richard Petty, uh, race car driver, and open the book to Richard Petty, car owner. And hopefully I can have a successful career as Richard Petty, the car owner. shot is live from Atlanta Motor Speedway. You see the jammed infield. The King's minions turned out in record numbers today to see his final ride. And they may be part of the all-time record Georgia traffic jam. Some of them will be here for a long, long time, but what they saw today was certainly well worth it. Portrait of a King is presented by First Brands Corporation, makers of STP gas treatment, and in part by Smooth Bush Beer and Easy Drinking Bush Light and by Goodyear, number one in tires. You know, kings once crowned typically rule for life. Turning over the driving chores doesn't mean Richard is abdicating his throne. But he's reached the final milestone as a driver, and so it's time to think about how we're going to remember this guy. I'll remember him three ways. One, he didn't plan any of this. He just did his best and let the chips fall. Two, he lived the golden rule, and for a race driver, that's not always easy. And three, he has great taste in hats and glasses. His colleagues, friends, and family will add the final few brush strokes to our portrait of a king. I'm Dave Despain. So long, everyone. In 1964, Richard Petty won the Daytona 500 for the very first time and qualified a stock car Plymouth almost 175 miles per hour. He was the biggest news in stock car racing. In August of 1964, I ran my first Grand National race. I was in awe of everyone there. But one fellow walked up to my car, stuck out his hand, and said, Hi, I'm Richard Petty. I'll never forget. You think about the idea, well, maybe he's getting too much credit, or, you know, maybe somebody else didn't, didn't get enough, or something like that. But you only have to think about it a few minutes and say, No, he earned it. He's earned every bit, and what he did was good for the sport. It wasn't just good for Richard Petty. I'm just thankful to have had the father that I've had, and I've had the kind of life that any daughter could ever dream of, and I just want to say how proud I am of my father and that I love him very much.
thank you. Thank you for, thank you for the values that you've, that you've given to us. Thank you for the wonderful father that you have been. And thank you for being the person that you are. And I love you. One of the things that impresses me most about Richard Petty is the fact that after seven championships, 200 wins, and all the other things that he accomplished in the sport, that he hasn't changed. He's still the same Richard Petty that I remember racing against for the first time in 1959. And I'm so happy that the six and a half years that I spent driving race cars were during a part of his career. I think to me, uh, not only in racing, but in my personal life and growing up, that Richard Petty meant everything to me. Uh, he taught me everything I know, whether it's driving a race car, uh, how to deal with fans, uh, how to treat people. And I, I think in that aspect, you can't separate Richard Petty from Linda Petty. They're both the same as far as that goes. And they both just gave us a good set of values uh, to grow up on. And, you know, I, I can't think of any other way to thank them except say I love them. I just wanted to say how proud and honored I am to have been a, a part of Richard Petty's life and that I'm getting all choked up. And that um, he really is a hero. I don't know why my path crossed with Richard Petty, but it did. And I'm just so thankful that I've been a part of his life.